So let's talk about this article. It's called The Great Regression. It's from a publication called Taste. What was the publication? It's going to load. Taste Cooking. The author is John Bonnet, B-O-N-N-E, with an accent. And I have a couple quotes that I want to share here because the the gist of it is he's angry that the power lunch is having a bit of a resurgence. And the restaurant that he decides to lean into and kind of attack here is the Tack Room, which is, most of you know, Thomas Keller's latest project at New York's Hudson Yards. He does bring up the other restaurant that might come to mind when you think of this kind of dining experience, which is The Grill, which is owned by the, you know, Teresi Group and uh, Mario Carbone. But the first quote here is, Quote, it helps to know that Tack Room is a remake, the third variation on a theme. In 2015, during renovations at the French Laundry, Keller did Ad Lib, a pop-up at Napa's Silverado Resort and Spa. Here, America's most celebrated chef could revisit the sort of ritzy dining he began his career with. Steak, shrimp cocktail, and Caesar salad prepared tableside, sometimes by Keller himself. Clearly, Keller liked the idea. He repeated it at the Surf Club near Miami, the house restaurant for a hotel and a private club, a revival of what once what once was one of Miami's toniest spots. And then continuing, he says, quote, this sort of food, Keller explained in an interview with CNBC's Power Lunch, of course it was Power Lunch, was a tribute to his childhood, namely to the restaurants his mother Betty ran in Florida, which specialized in what Keller described as continental cuisine, end quote. And that, I think, was the kicker for me. And especially, it, there's a later story where we talk about culinary education, and I was doing some like background research on famous chefs. And Thomas Keller has this history of working in, like he says, continental cuisine, but then also old school French. So why is it bad that he wants to return to that kind of cooking, but it's not okay, but it is, but it, why is that not okay, but then it's super okay for someone like Rosio Sanchez to work at Noma, and then when she goes back to cooking Mexican food, it's like applauded and lauded. Do you know what I mean? Like, he is excited because he likes the luxurious, opulent dining room and the tableside service and all of that. But Rosio Sanchez likes a taco, and because it seems to be more accessible, and they get into it in this article. They talk about politics. They talk about um, how these places are, quote-unquote, one percent oasises, and he's talking about tack room in Hudson Yards. Hudson Yards, of course, being the one percent oasis. And he talks about um, how Ken Himmel and Stephen Ross are big fans and supporters of Keller. Um and the frustrating thing is it would be different if there was like there was only steakhouses in Hudson Yards. But then he goes on to talk about how David Chang has Kawi, which is, quote, perhaps his most boldly Korean spot in an empire of more than a dozen restaurants around the globe. And then there's, of course, Little Marcado, uh, Marcado Little Spain from Jose Andres in the same space. So it's not that there's a lack of options. I think the the problem is people see places like the grill and tack room as a place for and you can correct me if i'm wrong here but they see it as a place for old white dudes to go out old rich white dudes that's also the the problem you know because there's enough little little italy places where old white dudes go out but they're not paying 85 dollars for a main course and then the guy goes into talking about Bill Addison and New Romanticism, which we've covered on the show, as almost like a way to say, like, I understand what hap what's happening in food. It doesn't really match towards what the article is actually talking about here. Um, what other quotes do I have highlighted here? It says, quote, in the end, what food and settings like this are truly about is making space for the powerful. And the most costed of power spaces was the Four Seasons. And then they talk about how the Four Seasons went through a giant, like, $40 million renovation, and then it ended up closing. It says, quote, even Seagram Building co-owner A.B. Rosen figured out that bit out, sort of. He was explicit that he wanted the, the grill to be, quote-unquote, fun, rather than a power spot, even as he acknowledged that the actual fun people might not be able to fork over $250 for dinner. 
In which case, why are these places here? The only way to justify the ludicrousness of an $85 Sol Meunier is to conclude that these prices are not a bug, but a feature. The new conspicuous consumption marked by its attempt at inconspicuousness. So... He says, and that part of the great regression, at least, is welcome to go away because the past couple of years should have taught us that restaurants can reasonably be judged today, not only on their food, but their values. And so I think that is the underlying thing that this person is trying to allude at, is that you value being a safe haven, quote unquote, for these people who do bad actions outside of the restaurant to congregate and flex on each other. And do these sorts of things. And my question for you, the question that I want to pass on to you folks is, is that reasonable to assume that a restaurant should be responsible for being complicit in these things? You know what I mean? Like, because compared to anything else, right? If something shady happens in a gas station parking lot, should we then say that gas stations are the problem? It's a genuine question because I I don't like seeing places that put their reputation on the line and put great service out into this world getting torn down because of the clientele that they naturally end up attracting. I don't think that there's a specific form you can fill out on the Tack Rooms website to make a uh, reservation for a, a private table where some shady shit's going to go down. That doesn't exist. You can be mad at the type of people that go to these places because they are a certain way, but this should not reflect poorly on the restaurant. That's my point that I'm trying to get at. I'm not mad that this person is observing these things. People can draw lines wherever they want to draw lines, right? You can say that by supporting someone that ships things across the country, you're supporting fossil fuels. You could technically say that. I just get angry when you make it seem like the restaurant is supporting sexual harassment or because you're making it so easy for rich white dudes to congregate, you're inherently making it harder for people of color to succeed. That is not the case. I have, I as a half Indian dude see no issue booking a table at the tack room. And I don't think anybody would see an issue in booking a table at the tack room. You can spend your money on whatever you want to spend your money on. That's my point. So I'd be curious to hear what your folks' thoughts are on this because it, it, it does get me a little salty when I see this stuff kind of happening. And this response just came in, so I'm going to read it here. Organized Chaos on Instagram says, I also think it's about affordability for those who want to enjoy an amazing meal and experience it but don't have the money to pay $250 a person for a tasting. But... And I agree. I agree that that's what they're pointing out here. But why is Blanca in Brooklyn not getting attacked? I think it's the overall... The the, the title of the article is The Great Regression. So the idea is some of the shady shit happened in the late 1900s. We've gotten to a point where restaurants aren't like that anymore. And now we're seeing they what they see as we're going back into that. And I don't think that's the case. I think what's happening is it's a case of, it's like fashion, right? Trends come and go. So you see white tablecloths coming into prominence, and then people get sick of white tablecloth dining, and the kind of grungy underground restaurant like a Momofuku Co. takes that market share because people want something different. And then everybody has California-inspired cooking over wood fire... uh, nine-ish course tasting menu that is kind of seafood focused that comes into prominence and then you see a restaurant down the road that's a white tablecloth that's serving a porterhouse or a prime rib for two and that's totally different than what you're used to seeing so then like it ebbs and flows do you know what i mean so uh, it's exhausting folks it's very very that's what I think the, 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 the issue is here. So we're going to leave it there. I really want to get into a conversation if anybody wants to kind of get into that. But continuing that, man, I thought this was going to be over, but it's not. The title of this article is 
on California's delicious and dull luxury dining circuit. And this is from the New York Times. So this is basically Preston Ganaway saying, I went to all the three Michelin star places in Northern California. And this is kind of, this was my experience. So he goes to French Laundry, he goes to a restaurant at Meadowood, and he goes to Single Thread. And I mean, he doesn't have, the, the, the weird thing is, if you read through this article, it's nothing but praise towards these places, and then he says it's boring, which is such a strange thing to do, especially from a critic's perspective. So he says, quote, dinner, which is likely to be a two to three hour long tasting menu, starts at around $300 a person before drinks. You pay for a temporary escape into pleasure and the, assur- that the, the assurance that even if you've done nothing all day but spit wine and sunburn, you'll be treated like a business tycoon who just closed a deal. At times, overwhelmed by the opulence, I felt like a character in a sci-fi movie who had sneaked onto a spaceship for the 1% now orbiting a burning planet, end quote. And so it just seems like fine dining can't can't catch a break, right? It's like you're constructing your dining room to be too opulent and it's not accessible enough. But then when you go too cheap, it's like, well, they didn't really try hard enough and it wasn't really all that uh, inspiring or it wasn't creative enough. And then the article comes out that well, we aren't really charging that much, and so we can't pay our people enough. And then the article comes out that says, fine dining is accepting too much free labor, and they're surviving off of exploiting people and not paying them enough. So it's like, you can't have both, you know? And I just don't, I, I, I think that when you live a life, when you see these things happen over and over again, as far as like you sit at a tasting menu and you have the glass of champagne with your snacks followed by the tasting menu. You know what I mean? Like I have such an appreciation. I publish my experiences as videos on YouTube, right? So I don't get tired with seeing these things. And it just seems like they're having people write about these things that get, that are tired of it. They're sick of it. They aren't inspired about it anymore. And then that shows in their writing which then ultimately causes detrimental effects towards this stuff. It's like, if you're not excited about it, why are you writing about it? Talks about a lot of the dishes that end up getting served, stunning production of the truffled mac and cheese at French Laundry. Quote, at the end of the meal, caught up in conversation with friends, I forgot about my espresso. A few minutes went by and maybe the coffee cooled and the toffee-colored crema dissipated. Without asking or making a show of it, a server brought out a hot one to replace it. The staff exuded confidence and warmth and their attentiveness was thorough, even after the check was paid, but never intrusive. But then at the same time, it's dull. You know, like, that's such an extra crazy level of service, but then you're going to say that it, was it was like meh who says that <laughs> like how how is that promote promotion to encourage restaurants to do more like do you want them to just leave your coffee on the table cuz then you would ultimately say i don't know like the ti- the timing of the serving of the coffee was bad like it just seems you can't you can't have both let's see it's Yash Veer on Instagram says, but you being a chef is different and the new bloggers and bucket listers writing on it is different. I, that's true. That's why I like to produce the content that I produce because I have the perspective of being both sides. I know what it's like to be back in the kitchen and working to feed people. And then I know what it's like to be in the guest seat. And I like that, that I do that. Oy, my Instagram is going to shut down in a little bit. Everybody should just be prepared for that let's see what other quotes did I write down because I, I I really oh man this is so frustrating to see quote and what I knew about Napa was that it was someone else's exorbitant fantasy land yawny and pampering it could be perfect but in the way that falling asleep during a massage is perfect and I had no plans to make a special journey back end quote and they definitely go into this for those of you that don't know Michelin deems a three-star restaurant as quote worth a special journey end quote which is of course a nod back to French chauffeurs and you know people taking their cars out into the countryside because Michelin wanted to sell more tires and he talks about is a trip to these places 
actually worth a special journey or not. And he says, quote, but trophy ingredients in wine country are often flown in from elsewhere. Sea urchin and wagyu beef from Japan, winter truffles from Australia. Ay, ay, ay. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, you can ask whatever question you want, anybody on Instagram right now. I think from the perspective of being mad that there isn't a lot of innovation happening in fine dining right now, I understand where that frustration comes from. The structure of the tasting menu, the style of service, the look and feel of a dining room, when you're on these kind of tours where you're going from a two-star to a three-star to another three-star back to a two-star to a one-star to another three-star, it can be easy to find similarities. But that is very akin to, like, I went to the Global Citizen Festival in New York this past week, and I could draw a lot of similarities to Lollapalooza, which I used to go to all the time as a kid when I was like a rowdy alternative indie music junkie. And I just loved going to concerts all the time. But what going to those shows was about for me and even this past week was about being there and understanding what it is that they were trying to do and appreciating what was happening in front of me as opposed to saying, oh, I've seen this before. Because at a certain point, I want this person to go to Vespertine and tell me how that's different or better or worse because that's the whole point of that concept was to be different. And then all of the critics bashed it for being something that was too outlandish and too out there. So it's like, what do you want? Do you want more of the same or do you want different? Do you want to pay our to, to do you want to be charged an amount of money that's going to allow for people to get paid or do you want things to be cheaper that's the ultimate question that i'm trying to like get to here and it, it's it's very frustrating organized chaos asks at that point do you blame the michelin guide or the restaurants i think the restaurants are at the mercy of the michelin guide i think that the michelin guide makes it very clear on what they look for in places like this and so, if anything, the influx in diners is a result of the Michelin Guide. And then it works the other way, right? Like, if you get really popular as a place and you don't happen to have any stars, someone from the Michelin Guide is probably going to go because they're going to get recommendations of, oh, well, you're in London, you got to make sure to go visit this place. And so it's like a chicken and the egg thing at a certain level. But should Michelin change how they evaluate restaurants? I don't think so. I think if anything, Michelin is getting too much flack for being not strict enough. Like people are mad that certain restaurants are getting Michelin stars because they don't fit the mold of what people see as traditional fine dining. It's a fascinating time to be alive, folks. And I wanted to put all this stuff on your radar because it can be very discouraging when you put all of this work into fine dining like fine dining work and then you look at what people are writing about your place of employment and it's nothing but bad news but then someone that actually understands the work that goes into it and the economics behind it goes and is completely blown away it's like who do i believe this person who has a seat of power and writes for this publication and can spew whatever they want about it being kind of meh it's very interesting. Lost our Instagram live. Nope, we're back. Cool. Okay. Um, the next story I want to cover is a short one, but it is an update that Renee Redzepi put out. And-